Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Mario's History Talks. I am your host, Mario Rostovsky. We have a great show for you today. And I know it's been a while since the last video, but hey, instead of layering on the excuses, let's cut right to the chase and go over some great content for you to chew over. Today, we will be going over the controversial but correct take on a true artist within the Masoian Pantheon, Mr. Grigor Parlichev. Parlichev is one of the more well-known Macedonian literary giants and one of the pioneers of the period of the National Awakening in the early 1800s, which saw Macedonian intelligentsia and culture move away from post-Hellenism back towards native Slavicism. So, why do I want to focus on the life of Perlichev today? Well, for one, I went to Macedonia over the summer in September and actually saw his house in Okrit, and I was awestruck. And secondly, understanding a life as tragic as Perlichev's can ultimately shed light on not only the development of the Macedonian identity, but also our own psychology as Macedonians. There's going to be a lot that we're going to be getting into today, but before we get started, as always, Take a moment now to like, comment, and subscribe down below. If you like what you see, definitely just take a moment to share the video with family and with friends, and also connect with me on social media. We are united, we are stronger that way. I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, you name it, we are there, and I'm finally caught up on those emails. So with that out of the way, let's get started. Grigor Perlichev was born in Ohrid in 1830, and like many young Macedonians who wanted any possibility of upward social mobility, he learned the language of the church and the intelligentsia of the day, the Greek language. And it may surprise you to learn it was not some poor lackey of the ecumenical patriarchate that got sent all the way from Greece to Macedonia to Hellenize the Macedonians and bring them up in this Greek milieu. It was actually none other than our old friend, Dimitar Milodinov, or, as he was known during this time period, Dimitrios Milanidis. All great names and all, considering he was actually probably a Romanian Vlach. But hey, I digress. So, Perlichev soon proved to be a prodigy within the Greek language, and mastered not only spoken Greek, but even the archaic Katerevusa a purified form of the Greek language that removed supposed foreign and modern words from use. This afforded him the opportunity to be a teacher of the Greek language around Tirana, Prilip, and Okrit. And at the behest of his mother in 1858, we all gotta keep our mothers happy, he went on to study medicine in the school in Athens. But he soon saw his passion was in the arts and poetry, and eventually transferred to the School of Linguistics during his second year after a hiatus back in Okrit where he saved up money. While in Athens, he penned what he considered his lifetime achievement, the amazing epic poem, O Amartolos. Now, this is our first stop in the study of Perlichev's life. The poem was written not only in Greek, but archaic and poetic Greek, supposedly so beautifully composed, it was said by one Greek statesman and poet himself that every verse sparkled like pure pearl. With Amartolos, he ended up winning the Athenian Poetry Contest of 1860, and he was called the Second Homer, and also a prime example of the continuing Hellenic presence all the way up in northern Macedonia. Yes, in fact, during this time period, Perlichev showed himself to be an ardent, anti-Slavic Hellenophile and a believer of the Hellenic idea for the Balkans, that is uniting all the southern ethnic Balkan communities under one Hellenic culture, church, and language. I mean, he called himself Grigorios Stavridis. He showed an open disdain for Slavic and Albanian culture's supposed backwardness. Even in the poem, he makes reference to the Gag Albanians, but he says, of course, that they are nothing more than Greeks. However, despite his services to the Greek nation, and in all honesty, his full embrace of the Greek ideal, he was ultimately rejected as a Greek. He was called a tool of Bulgarian propaganda. His poverty was mocked. Even his pronunciation of the Greek language was mocked, even though he had more command and more knowledge of it than most native-born Greeks in Athens, or to be more accurate, those first and second generation Hellenized Albanians. <laughs> and to add insult to injury, at this point he also found out that his old teacher Dimitar Milodinov was imprisoned, probably at the behest of the Greek bishop of Ohrid, Melitius. So, Perlichev, he was accepted 
as a Greek writer, but he was not accepted as a Greek. And with that, he rejected all the promises of money, fame, and wealth of being a Greek writer traveling Western Europe and pontificating the Greek language and the Greek ways. And what does he do? He returns back to Macedonia. Now, forget everything I just told you about Perichev calling himself Grigorio Stavridis for a moment. Disregard the fact that he fully embraced Hellenism, actually felt like a Greek, and even continued to write letters in Greek until the end of his life. That doesn't matter. He was only pretending. He was confused. It's only when he entered the Bulgarian phase of his life that we can trust his national orientation. Why? Well, because Wikipedia says so. <laughs> so, Perichev, during this time period, returns to Ohrid in 1862, completely disillusioned by Hellenism, even though he continued to teach in Greek. During this time period, Perichev attached himself to the growing anti-patriarchate movement and fought for Slavic literacy churches in Macedonia as opposed to Greek ones. The primary vehicle for this anti-Greek Slavic counter-response was of course the Bulgarian movement, no doubt aided by strong Russian Slavicist influence, nation building and interference dating back to the 1840s. So what does he do? He goes to Constantinople to be educated in the Slavic language. He translates his poems in a language he calls Common Slavic, as well as Homer's Iliad. He pens the famous poem 1762 about the abolition of the Ohrid Archbishopric in a type of Slavic Esperanto with Macedonian, Bulgarian, and Church Slavic influence. He even gets imprisoned for his activity by the same Greek bishop of Ohrid, much like his teacher Miladinov before him. So, what is his reception in Bulgaria for all his efforts towards pan-Bulgarism and pan-Slavicism? Is he treated like a hero? Absolutely not. For his works in translating the Iliad to Bulgarian, smacking as it did of course of Macedonian regional dialects, he was derided for not having a command of even the most basic components of Bulgarian, much less any artistic qualities to speak of. The famous Bulgarian poet Hristo Botev, he penned a satirical poem about Parichev, stating he should have been lashed had he penned such drivel. Then of course we have the poet Karavelov. He called Parichev an empty pumpkin head. So, Despite his best efforts, he was excluded from Bulgarian society for both his weak command of the Bulgarian language and also his literary work. Yes, the great champion of the Bulgarian idea and language could not even master his native language, but could master Greek and ancient Greek with no problem, and even Albanian and Turkish. So much for the Bulgarians to be proud of, so much left there. So which of course brings up a possible question, to what end was Perlichev, a man very clearly skilled in language as a clear polyglot, resistant to fully adopt in Bulgarian as a means to preserve his natural spoken Macedonian, or at the very least have a unified Slavic language that incorporated parts of both Macedonian and Bulgarian? No one knows. Either way, Perlichev was dejected by the treatment from the Bulgarians. In one of his letters, Perlichev wrote, Grigor Perlichev, Ubiti Bulgarum killed by the Bulgarians. So what are we to walk away with from the life of Perlichev? Well, obviously, his life is like that of the quintessential tragic poem filled with pain, rejection, disillusionment, and isolation. By the end of his life, Perlichev seems to have rejected both Greek and Bulgarian nationalism and retreated to a form of local nationalism around the Ohrid area, while also showing indications of an incipient early Macedonian national identity as well. By all accounts, he never gave up on the Macedonian vernacular and everyday speech. Uh, he taught at the Bulgarian Men's High School in Salonika, and there he educated the next generation in the revolutionary zeal for Macedonia. And it was here that he gave his famous rousing and patriotic speech on the occasion of the 1000th anniversary of the death of St. Methodius. And we know by the speech given in Macedonian, he clearly considered Macedonia as a land with a history and a people, with a national pantheon stretching from Alexander the Great right down to St. Cyril and Methodius. And of course, it is also worthwhile to point out that during the speech, he thanked the Bulgarian delegation in attendance for coming from their fatherland over to our fatherland. Interesting. Now, at various points of his life, he also showed a preferential treatment towards the use of the Macedonian language for instruction in Macedonia, stating, and I quote, it is more sweet 
to be instructed in one's mother tongue, and he even talked about having translated the Psalms into local Macedonian. Now, this is not to say that Prlichev had a fully developed Macedonian consciousness like we do today. Few did back then. But we can at least see the natural progression towards that, since Macedonianism ultimately came about as a native rejection against foreign propaganda and influence in Macedonia, whether it be Greek, Bulgarian, or Serbian. And of course, we do have to ask ourselves to what degree did Prlichev, being born in a pre-nationalistic Balkan community, even understand the concepts of modern nationalism? He was born in an era spousing remnants of the Byzantine medieval concept of identity where religion was the primary indicator of identity and where a person's whole concept of group identity may at best have been a small radius around their place of birth. Even venturing to a neighboring town or village would have been seen as a source of homesickness and alienation to the average person of the time period and Prlichev, per his autobiography, was no exception to this and early in his life, he suffered from long bouts of separation and alienation. So now let's take a step back and see the bigger picture. We see that Prlichev, an idealistic and devoted poet, was ultimately seduced to the idea of Western style romantic nationalism, an idea that he never truly took to heart, but accepted it to in turn be accepted, which tragically never proved to be the case. Now, Prlichev was a rarity that, in the fact that he was fortunate enough to even be educated, to even be exposed to the idea of nationalism. Macedonia during this time and well into the 20th century would have been populated predominantly by illiterate peasantry whose loyalty and entire sense of identity would have been familial, religious, and regional. To say that the greater Macedonian population had retained a semblance of a Bulgarian national identity since the 10th century a concept that was nebulous even to the small educated elite is nothing short than a willful manipulation and distortion of history, full stop. We even see how the labels Greek, Turkish, Bulgarian, and Vlach during this time period could correspond to religious identification as well as socioeconomic positions in society. Greeks were the merchants and the city dwellers and the supporters of the patriarchate while Turks were predominantly the Muslims, which oftentimes included other ethnic groups, but those that were in a position of authority for the empire, the servants. Bulgarians tended to be the Slavic-speaking Orthodox peasantry and the common folk, while Vlachs were those nomadic sheep herders. What we can comfortably walk away with, though, is that it's almost encoded in the Macedonian DNA to want to serve other people's interests, to feel accepted, and be seen as equals. This ultimately comes down to a Macedonian inferiority complex that has sadly plagued and continues to plague us. We now continue ritualistically sacrificing and humiliating ourselves before the altar of the EU to be accepted as a Western democracy and promote values that are quite frankly alien to us, only to be called North Macedonians and be treated as nothing more than pawns on a chessboard. Parlichev had the wherewithal to at least reject both Hellenism and Bulgarism by the end of his life, when it was sadly all but too late. So we may revere Prlichev, we may clash with the Bulgars as to whether he was Macedonian or Bulgarian, but we ultimately fail to understand him to the degree to be able to introspectively apply his life experiences onto our own for it to be a moral compass for the future. So folks, with that, we are wrapping up today's episode on Grigor Prlichev. I really hope you can walk away with something more than the simple talking points as to whether he was Macedonian or Bulgarian. Like I said, his successes and his failures continue to be a compass of sorts for Macedonians, and uh, I think he really is kind of the prototypical Macedonian in that regard. So I'm going to get to work now on a new video. I promise we'll be uh, having more content here soon. Definitely share this video if you did like it. And if you have any kind of questions, uh, shoot me a message. I'm going to see you again soon. Be the Deposravani. Stay safe. And as always, keep fighting. So Mike and Macedonia. Until next time, folks. Bye.